Good afternoon. Uh, I'm Paul Sicari. I've been at Tri-City for about 25 years. I hate to say that too loudly, but um, I'm going to talk about rusty hinges today. So hopefully this applies to your practice. Um, basically, I'm going to talk about valvular heart disease, mainly the stenotic type. Just to start with, a little bit of overall statistics. 2.5% of the population has valvular heart disease, just to give you an idea. The older you get, the more chance you have of getting valvular disease. Mitral valve disease in general is more common than aortic valve disease. As far as rheumatic heart disease is concerned, it's kind of like almost a rarity now in the United States and in the industrialized countries. We see some from Mexico, we see some from uh, Southeast Asia and some of the underdeveloped countries, but Asia and Africa, you can see 15 million cases of rheumatic heart disease a year and almost a quarter of a million deaths from that. So it gives you an idea of better health care, better longevity. Um, so I'm going to first, I'm going to stress uh, talking about aortic stenosis today because that's probably the most common one we see in stenotic valve disease. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about mitral valve stenosis, but mainly that's rheumatic heart disease, and then a rarity is tricuspid stenosis. So to begin with, in regards to aortic stenosis, most common cause is degenerative. So a third of the patients over the age of 75 years old will develop aortic sclerosis. I want to stress sclerosis, meaning not stenosis, but wearing or thickening of the valve, but not narrowing of the valve. And about 10% of those patients that have sclerosis will go on to develop aortic stenosis. I think it's important to recognize that um, when you see sclerosis, you want to recognize that that's a risk factor for atherosclerosis. So you see somebody with sclerosis, you want to look at their risk factor profile and make sure that you treat all their risk factors that are going on. So if they're a smoker, to get them to stop smoking. If they have diabetes, to treat it. Metabolic syndrome, to treat it. Um, and of course, male uh, sex over the age of 40, an increased risk factor. So you, when you see sclerosis, you want to look at that patient also from the standpoint of atherosclerosis. If you can see here, over 50% of people in the next five years after they've been diagnosed with aortic sclerosis will either suffer an MI or some type of cardiovascular death. So it is an important factor to recognize. The other cause of aortic stenosis is congenital of the bicuspid aortic valve. It's more common than in men than in women. As you can see, 0.6.1%. It has a 9% uh, incidence of first-degree relatives developing a bicuspid aortic valve if the patient has that. It's an autosomal dominant trait. Um, and most of these patients that we see, I put in here less than 70, but most of them come to our attention in their late 40s, early 50s. And so when you hear a murmur and uh, aortic valve disease, think bicuspid aortic valve in the younger age group. Half of these patients develop uh, uh, aortic root dilatation, and half of the patients that we replace valves on are related to bicuspid aortic valve. Now, the symptoms are the most important thing in diagnosing uh, when the patient comes to your office is dyspnea on exertion and decreased energy. If you think of the valves getting stenotic, less blood going across the valve, less energy, therefore less ability to uh, walk up that hill, ride the bike, uh, also, um, shortness of breath, those are the most common symptoms. They're very slow and progressive. So patients with aortic stenosis that are developing progressive uh, disease, these symptoms will be very subtle. So it's helpful to talk to the patient's spouse or family member to get an idea of the reduction in their exercise capacity. When they develop these symptoms of heart failure, syncope, and angina, they already have advanced aortic stenosis. So we want to try to identify that before this happens, unless the patient never goes to the doctor. You can see here the mortality for these uh, goes up from angina to syncope to heart failure. Heart failure is a bad, ominous sign for patients with aortic stenosis. So on a clinical exam, when you see them in the office, of course, you're listening for a heart murmur. This is a systolic murmur. It's best heard in the aortic region, so the right upper uh, uh, sternal border. 
The murmur oftentimes radiates to the apex, and the murmur oftentimes, to, uh, you'll hear it two over six, and then as it gets louder, it's more easily heard. Just remember that as this valve becomes more stenotic, actually the murmur can get softer. So you can miss it if they have very severe aortic stenosis, the murmur now is very soft. You can look, feel the carotid upstroke. If it's decreased, that's another sign that they have significant aortic stenosis. The, the second heart tone actually becomes diminished, which it should be loud up here in the uh, aortic region of the chest. So just remember these, these clinical findings. So as a cardiologist, the mainstay for diagnosis is the echocardiogram. So you hear a murmur, you're worried about it, you send them for an echocardiogram. That's the mainstay for diagnosis, both for the cardiologist and as a primary care physician. We use cardiac catheterization for patients that are going to surgery that are less than the age of 40. We oftentimes won't do a heart cath. If they're over 40, oftentimes we will do, a, most of the time we'll do a heart cath because we want to look at their coronary anatomy, make sure they don't have obstructive uh, disease before they go to surgery to replace the valve. We do use the stress test and very cautiously in patients that say they're not symptomatic. They deny they have any symptoms and occasionally we'll put them on the treadmill, we'll walk them gently. Of course, if they can only walk a minute on the treadmill or two minutes on the treadmill, that answers the question. If their blood pressure does not rise more than 10 millimeters of mercury when they're on the treadmill, that's a bad ominous sign and that indicates that they are symptomatic, they just are not recognizing those symptoms. So when we use the echo, of course we're looking, this is the uh, picture that we see on uh, 2D of echo, left atrium, left ventricle, here's the aortic valve, this is the right ventricle, and you can see right here is where we look at the valve, we measure the opening of the valve, and we also put a Doppler wave through here, and we measure the velocity across the valve. And so we get a peak velocity, and then we also do a tracing of the uh, area under this curve, and it gives us a mean gradient uh, in addition to a peak gradient. So when you get your report, you get several values on that report. You get a velocity of the valve, you get a mean gradient, and you get the valve area. And I should stress that this is the one that we depend on that's most sensitive in diagnosing aortic stenosis. From a technician standpoint, if they measure the diameter of the aortic root incorrectly, that can vary this number tremendously, whereas this is a much more accurate way to look at aortic stenosis. So mild is less than 20 millimeters of mean gradient, moderate 20 to 40, severe greater than 40, very severe 60. So this is the magic number, is greater than 40 millimeters of mean gradient, a valve area of less than one, or a peak velocity of four meters per second or greater. That is the classification for severe aortic stenosis using the echo. So the progression of disease of the aortic valve is variable. And you can see here that um, what we're looking at on mean gradient is this four to 10 millimeters of mean gradient per year. So if they have a mean of 20, it may take between two and a half and five years for them to get to the point of severe. Um, we also look at the valve area of 0.1 to 0.4 per year as the progression goes from mild towards uh, severe. So you can see for patients with mild aortic stenosis, we recommend repeating the echocardiogram every two years. For people that have moderate aortic stenosis, we recommend that we do the echocardiogram once a year because we don't want to miss um, that patient uh, developing severe aortic stenosis. And this is a progression of symptoms from mild, about 8% a year symptoms, to moderate, accelerates, and of course severe. It's almost, most of those patients are gonna be symptomatic uh, within the year. So, what do we do with aortic stenosis to, to fix it? Well, we replace the valve. That's the most uh, common process that we do is aortic valve replacement. In those patients with, um, that are over the age of 65, we oftentimes use bioprosthetic valves. We really aren't using mechanical valves as much anymore in that age group. And it's because these valves are lasting longer. They're as lasting 15, 20 years now. 
in the bioprosthetic uh, valves, and therefore um, the mechanical valves have fallen out of favor as far as the older age group. In the younger patients, like bicuspid aortic valves that are 40, 50 years old, we will put in mechanical valves in those, remembering that those patients have to be anticoagulated forever, whereas the bioprosthetic valves do not. Um, so that's an important thing. Remembering that, as I mentioned or on one of the other slides, we're looking also at the aortic root dilatation. We see that in bicuspid aortic valve. So when it gets to four and a half centimeters, that is an indication that when the surgeon goes in to replace the valve, that he has to replace the ascending aorta. Um, if patients get to a 5.5 centimeter aortic root dilatation and the valve still has not reached severity of stenosis, even then that's an indication to replace the root. So 55, greater than 55 is an indication for surgical intervention. Now there's a lot of hoopla in regards to TAVAR, which is transcutaneous aortic valve replacement or transcatheter aortic valve replacement. And this is for patients, this is the newest technique that we have available. It's basically done without an operation. It's done percutaneously, entering through the groin or through the chest wall. Um, this procedure has been approved for patients that are not surgical candidates. So it's not being used for everybody. So you can't go, well, I don't want the uh, open, I don't want my chest open, I just want one of these. It's not approved for that. So these patients have to be turned down for surgery by the cardiovascular surgeon, and then they become a candidate for trans, uh, transcatheter re, uh, valve replacement. So this is oftentimes the older age group in the 80s and 90s that have bad pulmonary disease or bad renal disease, and the surgeon feels they just aren't going to make it with open heart surgery. The recovery period is going to be awful. Um, they turn them down, then that patient becomes eligible to have this procedure done. Um, to have this type of program, you have to have a lot of, a whole team. So you have to have a, the surgeon, the cardiologist, nursing, and everything to have this program available, and so that, um, and a volume. And so right now, the main centers that are doing this are Sharp. Uh, UCSD is doing it and Scripps Green is doing it. So that's oftentimes where these patients will go within our uh, area. I think it's important to stress to treat the risk factors. I don't want to overstress that, that patients with sclerosis, valvular heart disease are at increased risk for developing atherosclerosis or coronary disease. So it's very important to make sure you identify that and, and work them up. As you can see here, here's an example of this valve open. It's, of course, wrapped around a balloon tightly. There's a wire that's placed across the valve, and then that valve is sized and expanded and uh, placed into the aortic valve position. This is for aortic stenosis, not for any type of leaky valves like aortic regurgitation. So next is mitral valve stenosis, which is a little bit less common in this country. About 10% uh, of mitral valve disease is due to rheumatic heart disease, more in women than in men. Most of the patients that I see are the elderly patients that have wearing of their valves. So they have mitral antler calcification and wearing of the leaflets, but it's oftentimes very uncommon to see mitral stenosis and, unless they have rheumatic heart disease. So the most common causes are degenerative, uh, also patients that have had mitral valve commissurotomy in the past when they were younger, they may come back with mitral stenosis, or if their valve has been replaced, then they come back with uh, stenotic prosthetic valve, Does, that's one of the other causes of mitral stenosis. Now, symptoms with mitral stenosis are mainly right heart failure. So this is where the blood's trying to get across the left atrium into the left ventricle, and it can't get across. And the blood's coming from the, the lungs back into the left atrium. So, number one, low cardiac output. They have fatigue. They have no energy when they exert themselves. Shortness of breath, back, a backflow into the uh, pulmonary vasculature, hemoptysis, pulmonary edema. They can actually get dilatation of the left atrium, compress 
the recurrent laryngeal nerve and get hoarseness. That's called Ortner syndrome. So that can happen as well. As far as uh, the clinical exam, uh, allowed S2. Remember that the mitral valve is stenotic, staying open longer. So when the ventricle squeezes, that, that uh, first heart sound becomes extremely loud. Um, sorry about that. Uh, opening snap, of course, in uh, early diastole. That opening snap and then that diastolic rumble that you're supposed to hear that's not easy to hear. You got to lay them on their left side and really listen closely because I have had a hard time sometimes hearing it as well. It's a diastolic decrescendo rumble. Oftentimes these patients have right heart failure symptoms so they can get peripheral edema, they can get ascites, they can get hepatomegaly, all symptoms of right heart failure. So in regards to workup, uh, EKG is helpful if you see left atrial enlargement and right ventricular enlargement. That helps to clue you in in addition to the clinical exam. The gold standard again is the echocardiogram. Very useful in looking at the valve, measuring the size of the left atrium, seeing if there's any thrombus in the left atrium, determining the mitral valve area uh, of the valve. All that can be done with the echocardiogram. These patients all get cardiac catheterizations prior to intervention. And what we're looking for is, of course, coronary anatomy again, looking at to make sure they don't have obstructive coronary disease. Do they need a bypass at the same time they have the valve either repaired or replaced? Also, you're measuring uh, pulmonary pressures. So the higher the pulmonary pressures are, the more ominous the uh, mitral, or more severity of the mitral stenosis and the pulmonary vascular resistance. So we're going to go through some of these numbers. So when we measure on the echocardiogram, we can actually measure the valve area. It's similar to the aortic valve. Less than 1 is considered to be severe. Uh, moderate, 1 to 1.5, and greater than 1.5 is mild. And a normal valve is around 4 to 5 centimeters. So what we're really looking at here also on, on the echo, we also do this on the heart cath, is we're looking at the pulmonary systolic pressure greater than 50 is severe mitral stenosis, mean gradient greater than 10. We're also looking at the pulmonary vascular resistance. So you have patients that are undiagnosed with mitral stenosis and they're out there long term, they can develop severe pulmonary hypertension to the point where their pulmonary vascular resistance gets so high that when you replace the valve, actually they continue to have pulmonary hypertension and they do not get better. So you want to catch them before they get to the point where they have severe long-standing uh, pulmonary vascular resistance. So as far as treatment for mitral valve stenosis, we have a lot of options. We can replace the valve, we can repair the valve, we can balloon the valve, and in underdeveloped countries we can do actually uh, commissurotomy. So in this country, uh, we use uh, valvuloplasty using a balloon across the valve, and that's based on there's several protocols that look at the risk of the valve being ballooned based, based on valve thickness, calcification, mobility, and subvalve door thickening. And there's a, a protocol uh, which is uh, these four uh, things and their severity, and it's based on the number, uh, depending on the degree of all these uh, factors that dis determine whether they are a candidate for valvular plasty. Of course, most of the time now, we're trying to repair the valves when they're diseased. In this uh, diagnosis of mitral valve stenosis, most of the time when they come uh, to us, that valve cannot be repaired. It's so sclerotic and thickened that those valves end up getting replaced. And as Dr. Pavelli will talk about later in regards to prolapse and uh, that, oftentimes this is the most common uh, uh, entity that we do for treatment. But in the patients with mitral stenosis, in the elderly age group, it's going to be replacement. Okay? Now, as far as anticoagulation is concerned, any of these patients that, of course, are identified with left atrial thrombus on the echo, they need to be anticoagulated. If they had a peripheral emboli, they need to be anticoagulated. And if they develop atrial fibrillation, they need to be anticoagulated. And I should stress, 
When I say anticoagulation, I mean Coumadin or Warfarin. It's not approved for our new agents, unfortunately, so Prodexa and Xarelto and Eliquis, the thrombin uh, 10 and thrombin 10A inhibitors are not approved for this diagnosis, so we don't want to use it in this, age, in this group of mitral stenosis. And then last but not least, tricuspid stenosis, which is extremely rare. This is the third valve that gets involved with rheumatic heart disease, mitral being the number one, aortic being the number two, and tricuspid being the number three valve as far as incidence. So you can see here, three, three, three to 5% of rheumatic mitral stenosis develops tricuspid stenosis. So it's not that common. 90% due to rheumatic heart disease and some of the other causes that can ca uh, lead to tricuspid stenosis, uh, congenital, of course, carcinoid, whipples, atrial myxoma, pacemaker lead fibrosis, where the lead actually starts to create a reaction to the leaflets and gets stenotic around the lead. Um, of course, if they've had their valve replaced and it becomes stenotic, and then endomyocardial fibrosis. So symptoms, okay, this is on the right side. Blood's trying to go from the right atrium to the right ventricle. Can't get across, what happens? Back up, so low cardiac output, can't get the blood across into the heart. So you have fatigue, less energy, and then you have all the symptoms of right heart failure. So ascites, peripheral edema, hepatomegaly, all those symptoms are going to occur with tricuspid stenosis. And the, on clinical exam, the murmurs are going to be similar to mitral stenosis, except for they're going to be in a different spot. Instead of out at the apex, they're going to be along the left sternal border. Of course, again, an opening snap, diastolic rumble, prominent A waves in the neck. The neck veins are going to be dilated. When the left atri uh, right atrium contracts, it's going to create an A wave in the neck veins which are already going to be distended, so you're going to see that. And then, important, when you take a deep breath, when you have the patient take a deep breath, that murmur is going to get louder. So those are some of the, the factors you want to look for in tricuspid stenosis. Of course, the echocardiogram is, is the uh, gold standard for diagnosing. Less than one centimeter is severe tricuspid stenosis, same uh, protocol as we use for mitral valve. Mean gradient is a little bit lower. It's uh, greater than seven is what we use for severity. And then treatment is basically valve replacement. We, we, we found that when we did valvuloplasty on the tricuspid valve, we turned it from stenotic to severe tricuspid regurgitation. So nobody's really doing valvuloplasty anymore on the tricuspid valve. Medical management. You can try it, but it's not going to work very well if they have severe stenosis. And then replacement. Replacement is always the bioprosthetic valve, not a mechanical. And the reason for that is these patients are at increased risk for thrombosis, especially on the right side of the heart where there's lower flow and the pressures are lower. So all those patients will get a bioprosthetic valve.